Michael J. Migliori, and this is my review rundown for the months of August and September, Lake Artifact. A strange series of events led me to stumbling onto this film on Prime. During some downtime at work and in an odd mindset, I needed a film that I could watch in an hour and a half or so. Lake Artifact, clocking in at just under 90 minutes, really fit that bill. The film is very much a Black Lodge-esque style, high strangeness thriller. It starts out as your typical cabin in the woods with a group of young college kids getting away from the city to a town by the lake. They get lost on the way to the vacation house and strange things begin to happen to them. The first of which is an encounter with a hitchhiking stranger. He's a little out of sorts and has apparently been wandering the roads for three days with only a vague recollection as to why. But hey, he has beer, and so he must be good. Most of the group decide that's enough for him to be a nice guy. Most of the group except for Tommy who is obviously a film student and liberally makes references to film culture. He senses that something feels off about the stranger and coincidentally he also shares the stranger's first name. The strangeness really begins to amp up when they finally arrive at the cabin and after a night of partying, they awake the next morning to discover a picture of them all gathered at the cabin. A picture which none of them had ever taken at this lakeside cabin they had never been to before. In addition to all the high strangeness the kids experience at the lake house, the film is framed around the production of a documentary. We see interviews with a realtor from the area, the spokesperson for a strange religious group that apparently owns the town that the lake house resides in, and a historian who specializes in local cults of that area. So as things continue to make no logical sense with the guests at the lake house, we are periodically being fed lore, which begins to shed light on what may or may not be happening. I found the film to be pretty open to some loose interpretation. I was generally impressed with the film. I enjoyed it very much and I would attribute my enjoyment to the film to an understanding of what they were trying to do. While perusing the film's reviews on Amazon, I found that most of the negative reviews came from people that were either completely lost due, the, due to the strange narrative structure, or didn't understand what the hell was going on, or just refused to parse the information the way that the film was communicating it to them. A good summary of this film is that this film felt like a Rorschach test for unconventional storytelling, and I absolutely loved it. After Midnight, also found on Prime Video, is a film that toes the line between monster movie and relationship movie. Some would argue that that's one and the same. Who now? This film would argue that that is one and the same. The film is written and directed and stars Jeremy Gardner. Gardner has spent most of the 2000s writing, directing, or starring in a variety of independent thrillers and horror films. I'll be honest and admit that although I was not familiar with him or his work prior to After Midnight, because of After Midnight, I am very much interested in checking out the rest of his catalog. In After Midnight, Gardner plays Hank, an almost hillbilly-like country boy who has swept a city girl named Abby off her feet with his rugged and quirky charm. They move in together in a big plantation house in the middle of nowhere, USA. Things are going, well, apparently not so well, when Abby disappears one day, leaving only a cryptic note behind. The situation gets really messy, because ever since Abby has left, Hank has been visited nightly by a mysterious monster which has clawed at the door to the house, and it's even eaten Abby's cat. A cat likely symbolic of the couple's love for one another. Naturally, no one believes Hank's crazy story about his nightly visitor, and because of this, Hank is filled with paranoia. Amidst the stress of these crazy nocturnal visits, he tortures himself with memories of a time when he and Abby were much happier together. I came into this film expecting a different sort of movie. My impression was that this would be your typical low budget, minimalist monster movie. Slick editing and good direction coming together to make a great tense horror film. This film was way more ambitious than that. I can see someone walking away disappointed from this film if they came into this film expecting the next Cloverfield or Monsters. I plead you audience member, do not do this film such a disservice. There is a rich and profound narrative that unfolds throughout the course of the film that really brings you an appreciation for the potential for the horror genre to speak to something more than just superficial jump scares and gross practical effects. 
For those of you familiar with my stance on the matter, you would know that I am an adamant defender to how genre films can be the avenue to express social criticism. This film is the perfect example of how thematic metaphor can be used to convey a richer meaning than what is on display. The monster movie was the original horror film, and while After Midnight carries on that legacy, it does so by being pretty original. The Frozen Ground I originally came across this film a few years back when I was writing for a movie website. I remember being intrigued by the premise, but I don't ever remember it reaching the light of day. The film is about infamous Alaskan serial killer Robert Hansen, and stars Nicolas Cage, Vanessa Hudgens, and John Cusack. What intrigued me most about this film, since at the time I couldn't really say I was wholly into the true crime kick, was that the serial killer Robert Hansen would be played by John Cusack. I thought whatever way you looked at it, he was a bizarre pick to play a man that kidnapped, raped, and hunted sex workers in the Anchorage area in the early 80s. I found out later that the likely reason why this unorthodox casting was in fact perfect casting was because Hansen himself was despite his sociopathic pastime, a pimple-faced dweeb with a speech impediment. While this film was on my radar relatively early, I never got around to hearing anything else about it. Turns out this film bombed hardcore. This movie was just really bad. It takes what I feel was a pretty interesting slice of the American nightmare and just sucks all the life out of it. It drones on for the length of its 105 minute runtime like a made for TV series about courtroom filing. Everything is removed from obscurity and all suspense expunged from the narrative. It's almost like a very dark insurance commercial. The Frozen Ground is one of those films where it's hard to pinpoint exactly where they got it wrong, but it becomes very apparent early on that the film is a boring mess. Another thing, I understand that the film it has tangential connection to sex work and sex workers. The film seems to also have this strange obsession with displaying strippers in their work environment, naked people all over the place. Also, one of the funniest things that I think I've seen this year on Netflix or anywhere else was 50 Cent as a pimp with a ridiculous straight perm wig on. The Dark Red. Not to be confused with Dario Argento's 1975 film Profundo Rosso, that by the way translates to Deep Red. This disclaimer is important since the only reason I watched this film was because I was confused as to whether this was supposed to be some sort of remake of that Italian giallo classic. That can't have been a coincidence, right? I mean, I imagine any filmmaker, especially when working within the horror thriller genres, must know about Dario Argento and that film, right? But enough about that inherent confusion with the similarities in the film's titles. The Dark Red is about a young mother, Sybil played by April Billingsley, who has been committed to an asylum for her own protection and that of those around her. Or as in this case, those who are no longer around her, because according to the doctors, she's seemingly misplaced her infant baby. The story from Sybil's end is a little different though. She claims that a mere 10 days previous, while on a trip with her fiance to visit his family, her baby was surgically removed from her in order to harvest its blood which happens to imbue the two of them with special powers. The first bit of the film is Sybil telling her story to the hospital assigned psychiatrist, and of course, she doesn't believe a thing Sybil say. We are shown through flashback the tragic course of events that have brought the film's protagonist to where we are now. The honest part is that the first portion of this movie is actually very intriguing. There is a very Stephen King nature to the film's story. It has obviously been influenced by his classics like The Dead Zone and Carrie. The narrative develops naturally and at a pace that doesn't feel as though any of the information is being rushed. This really lets the narrative marinate with the audience. This is especially effective since most of the film at this point is Sybil retelling the events that have led to her current situation. The addition of the psychologist adds a layer of skepticism to what we're being told. We're asked to consider more reasonable explanations despite the strong voice of the protagonist telling us how things went down. Unfortunately, as the film progresses, something becomes terribly clear. The film has painted itself into a corner. It has spent so much time developing this fascinating lore about a secret society that harvests the blood of individuals with supernatural powers in order to prolong their life and their influence over the world, and it has placed the protagonist in a situation where she can trust no one, no one believes her, and nobody has the power to help her regain her freedom or rescue her kidnapped baby. It's at this point that everything just falls apart. 
It's here that the film takes a dramatic turn towards the completely unbelievable. After hearing her tale, the psychologist implies, basically Loki tells Sybil that she can be set free if she just lies about having made everything up. So of course she does. Then in a nonsensical fashion, she enacts a plot to take on revenge against the secret society and to rescue her, take her kidnapped baby. The film goes full 80s action film preparation montage. There is such a degree of cringe and disbelief as you watch what you had originally thought to be an intellectual supernatural thriller morph into the worst straight to DVD empowerment flick that you've ever seen. It's enough to make you wish that the film had a blowout ending where she was actually just crazy the whole time and she imagined the whole thing. That would have honestly been a more satisfying ending to how this film resolves. So thank you ladies and gentlemen. I have been Michael J. Miglior and that is just a portion of the films that I've watched for you this last August and September. Stay tuned on my YouTube, on my Twitter, and on my webpage for some more review rundowns and some more content coming from me in the upcoming weeks. Thank you again for watching everybody and Godspeed.